Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. This Sunday marks 100 days for the hostages who are still being held in Gaza. That means it's been 100 days since so many worlds were destroyed. And since the world as we know it really changed forever. It's 100 days, or maybe it's just one very long day. That's hard. It's hard for us. Human nature is that we like to try to get back to some kind of normal routine. But of course, we all know that we can't go back to normal. Certainly not while we still have so many dear people who are being held hostage, but certainly not in the way the world has changed. We're grateful to Daniel and to Anna Klein for bringing for us this evening Devere and Maya, who will help us to continue to remember what we can't possibly afford to forget. For us to have Dear Maya here is a, a great support. It's a great support for us. And we're grateful that you're joining us. We're going to begin our program this evening as we begin programs these days with reciting to Hillen the Psalms prayer. We ask you to please with us. And you can repeat after me. Shir la ma'alo te sayinai le harim ne'ayin yavo ezrim. Ezrim ne'im Adonai ose shalai la'aretz. Al yitim l'mot aglata al yanum shomrah. Yidei lo yanum v'lo yisham shomer Yisrael. Adonai Shomaracha, Adonai Tzilacha, Uliad Yeminacha. Yomam Hashem Ashlo Yakeka, Liarach Balayla. Adonai Yishmor Kham Kora, Yishmor Et Nafshecha. Adonai Yishmor Tzitcha Balacha, Meyata, Liad Balayla. Shira Malod, Mima Akim, Kerapicha Aduna. Adunai Shima, Bikobi, Tiana, Uznata Kashibot, Akol Tachanina. Mima Bunuti Shmoria, Adunai Mia Amor. Ki Machas Licha, the man Tibur. Kibiti Adunai, Kibitana Shiv, Lidbarava Kapi. Sheila, do not be shamrim la boker, shamrim la boker. Echel Yisrael, all Adonai, Kim, Adonai, a chesed, the Arbe, Imo, Kedut. The Hui, Ke, at Yisrael, Mikol, Abunita. Please join me. Zachor, 
remember what to shop, don't forget. As I close my bench, I think that, that we're here to be here. To be here. To save the old Tavari Tavaro. To carry the burden with our brothers and our sisters. Brother Jonathan Sack says, when there is tragedy, and there has been the most horrendous tragedy to our people, to our holy land, the most horrendous tragedy since the Holocaust. We are in the Seba Odin Cairo. We are there to bear the burden with our brothers and sisters. And Rabbi Sack says, there's only one way you really can do that. Yes, we can show our support and we can hear from our, our guests just how much that support has meant to them. Yes, we can send things and volunteer my sack said, Book of Shemot has the word Shema 32 times. And 32 is the numerical equivalent of lead of heart. All we can do is listen with our heart, our mind, our soul. We can listen and we can stand with our brothers and our sisters. We have two a brother and a sister here who are really showing an enormous amount of courage, of dedication, of bravery, and of faith. And they're going to share with us, as you're going to hear soon, their experience. And they're here not to scare us, but to inspire us, not to cause us more fear, though I don't know how we can get up in the morning without it, but to help us understand that with faith, we can go on. There's absolutely no question that we need to be holding yad biyad, hand in hand, so that we can indeed go on. Because without that, I'm not sure how we can. And so we have faith, sure, sometimes we Use faith. But truly, if you use faith, you can go farther. This week's Parsha uses an expression that is so relevant to what our guests here today are doing. Moses was told, Stand up straight, get up early in the morning and stand up straight before the evil before you. And that's what we're doing here today. We got up and we are standing straight against evil, against everything in the world that is the antithesis of everything we stand for. You didn't come here to listen to Rabbi Posner or to me. You came here to listen to people who I truly am in awe of. And who the person who has brought them is a person who happens to be the father of children that were at Beth Bethlehem, so I consider them my children. Dan and Anna both truly see Beth Bethlehem as their home, even though they have a temporary residence in any of their homes. <laughs> and Dan has been the person who has spurred us on to action. Dan is going to introduce our guests and he's going to tell you a little bit about what's happening tonight. <coughs> but I couldn't get up here without thanking him and saying in front of our guests, we are here to be say the old and have We are going to be here to bear the burden with you in the best way we can. We're going to learn. But remember one last thing. The word Shema doesn't just mean hear, it means listen. And so we're going to try to hear you, we're going to listen to you, <coughs> and we're going to put all those words to enter our hearts. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being here, and thank you, David, for making us aware of all that is going on and for being the facilitator for tonight. But more importantly, for doing exactly what you're asking us to do. So say to all. Thank you. Thank you.
Mine's not working. I can speak loud with that. Uh, thank you for the both the Bethesdale community and also our many friends that are here tonight that are not part of the Bethesdale community. Uh, I'll pass it back to Maya very quickly. Um, Dr. Shore, I know you said this, uh, we're at temporary residence. I won't call Anna that you said that because she's pretty convinced full time and permanent. Um, uh, Anna helped put this together tonight. We had to make choices. Vera and Maya are uh, husband and wife, and they have a 14 month old son who's been stay, staying with us in Angela as well. So, uh, Maya has a lot of trust and faith in Anna to watch uh, Z in our absence, so Anna apologizes for not being here tonight. Uh, but the link that brings us all together in the first place actually stems from Anna's family. Uh, some of you know that her late grandfather, Nathan Krieger, was a Holocaust survivor. He survived Auschwitz, he survived the Death March, and he was saved by Schindler. He was one of uh, only nine uh, children in his family to survive. And through that relationship, through, uh, through his cousins, his DeVere's grandfather, Joseph, uh, Joseph Wiener, who's a 98 year old survivor who's still living in Israel today. And Joseph was uh, one of, uh, the only one of 13 siblings who survived the Holocaust. And after October 7th, after uh, you know, the worst day, uh, the worst atrocities that had taken place for. Uh, uh, for Jews around the world in my lifetime, and since the Holocaust, um, we got reconnected to our cousins from far out that we never had any type of relationship with because we needed help, we needed to reach out, we needed to help, and we needed to understand what was going on. And so, um, evolving from that, uh, we've been privileged to have both the beer and Maya in our home for the past two weeks. Um, we're amazed by their courage and their strength. I want to remind everybody we're going to be talking about some very difficult subjects tonight and experience some horrendous things. And the resilience that they have and the ability that they have to walk into a room in front of a number of strangers and share their story openly is something that we all should admire deeply. And just, I want to thank them in advance because I know how difficult it's been. Um, they're, both, they're from a, a kibbutz called Kafar Aza. For those of you who aren't familiar with, uh, with what a kibbutz is, um, it's essentially, it was a 900 person community in the southern part of Israel, about three kilometers from Gaza. It was a peaceful place. Uh, the beer will share. No one ever locked their doors, they didn't know where the food was from home. Uh, the people that lived there uh, all were professionals, they raised families. They were there for the quality of life, not for some idealistic reason. The beer is a civil engineer advised an attorney with the Ministry of Justice in Israel. Uh, and everything changed on October 7th. Um, and I think we'll kick it off, maybe, uh, Jeremiah, share with everyone sort of, you know, how that day started for you guys. So, uh, first good evening, and uh, thank you for having us, and thank you for coming. You know, it means a lot. Um, You know, in Israel, in the past uh, 20 something years, we had something we called you know, escalations. Uh, escalations is something that uh, once, twice a year, um, uh, one of the terror organizations in Gaza, Holocaust, used to shoot rockets uh, into Israel. Uh, 10, 15, 20, 50, 100. Day, a day, or two, three, four days, and, and every time it happened, we used to pack up, pack our bags, and wait for it to come down, jump into the car, and leave our houses for a few days, or for a week or two, and come back, and it's all come down. So that morning, um, started as. We thought it started as one of those uh, escalations. Um, I woke up early, and my woke me up. And I woke up after being awake all night with her baby, but that's <laughs> not. Um, yeah, she still woke me up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was Saturday morning, so it was getting into fights with your wife on Saturday morning. So we had to, to spend the day together the whole day. Um, 
uh, anyway, it was like around 6 in the morning. And, uh, my granny said, you know, Zeev, he was 11 months dead at the, the day. And we went to change, we were on our way out. Like every, like all the new fathers, and there was this place that we used to meet on Saturday morning with the red eyes, cursing that uh, they kicked us out of the house, you know, because we were playing with the babies. But my thought it's much earlier, so she asked us, told us, we could ask, told us uh, to stay and put in the bed for a bit longer, which was our miracle number one that day, because 10 minutes later the rocket started to fall, and uh, we thought it began just like another escalation. And so I went in to the safe room with Zim, and uh, I went out to bring the dogs with two dogs. One of them was on the beach, so uh, I put her in the, in the house, but the second one ran away and, uh, because of the explosions. And uh, after 10 minutes, I was standing in the garden calling his name. I decided uh, to go to respect to the dog. And, uh, when the rockets were falling all around, uh, I go back inside and I let the front door open. And, that morning was different because the amount of the rockets and it was something different. It was crazy. It was hundreds of rockets that fell uh, non stop. A few weeks later, we, we met, uh, two, three weeks later, we met one of our neighbors that told us that he was so happy to see us, to didn't believe it, to see us. And he told us that uh, that morning he was also outside, so he called the dog. And 30 seconds later, when he was inside his safe room, uh, closing the window, he saw five terrorists standing in our garden, the safe spot of ours. And uh, we want to believe that uh, because I left the door open for the dog, they probably thought that uh, one of them was already running inside and skipped our house and went to the next one. Um, it's important to say that the safe room in Israel is something, it's not like a panic room or underground shelter, it's just like another room in the house, uh, made of concrete, thick walls, thick as the ceiling, and... Uh, it, was, it was like our baby's room, so if you want to imagine the situation, imagine yourself standing in your baby's room, uh, with your baby's crib, a chair that you breastfeed or given a bottle on, his shelf of toys, a closet, a changing bed. But that was the room. Uh, we didn't have any supplies there, nothing like that. And very quickly, this room turned into hell. Like our house was right in the middle of a battlefield. <clears throat> and I think very quickly you understand that something different is happening. First, like Zeus said, it wasn't ordinary amount of bombs that we usually get. Yeah. I saw the difference immediately once I saw the look on Bria's face. Because he usually never panics from these things. He always has an answer for everything. He's been living there his whole life and he's always the one that's calming me down. And this time, I just saw his look and he kept on telling me, well, this never happened. This is something new. I've never heard these noises before. And I think very, like, after two minutes, uh, I started receiving these messages in my WhatsApp group and the woman of the kibbutz that they started to write that they can hear uh, weapon shots outside their window and they hear Arabic outside their homes. And I told that to the video and at the beginning he said, well, don't pay attention, people are just exaggerating, like, I know this woman, she's like this, she's like that. <laughs> but I think he didn't even have a chance. Which was true, by the way. <laughs> And not everything they wrote was accurate, but she still like exactly. this and like that. <laughs> but I think he didn't even finish his sentence, and we started to hear Arabic outside our window and the gunshots right outside our window. And we will tell the story, but uh, the whole time, our, our house is right on the way to where the young adults live. I don't know if people here have been to Kvaraza. I know a lot of people in the state are going to mission. So, it's sort of a crude analogy for people to understand what the, what the kibbutz looks like. It's not a 
traditional U.S. subdivision, the, the grid system for the streets. It's more like a, a resort that somebody would go to in terms of uh, you know, cottages that are dispersed all throughout the community, and not a, not a logical way to figure out where the, the, the homes are. And if you're not from the kibbutz, it's hard to identify where the houses are. And that's also a big part of why Miami here are here today. Their home is sort of almost like between two blocks, like set back behind the homes, okay. behind the entrances. Yes, and also the, the houses are very close to each other. So, like when I'm telling you, for example, that the house behind us burnt the ground, it's not a house in the next lot or something. It's like maybe the distance, the distance from our safe wall to that house is maybe the distance from here to the wall behind me now. Okay, so our house is located very close to where the young adults live, which was the area that got hit the most. So. From 6.30 in the morning until we got rescued almost, until they took us out of the house almost 24 hours later, it was a continuous battle outside of our uh, house. And we just kept on hearing explosions, shouts in Arabic, uh, things exploded on our wall, gunshots were fired on our window. And in the whole time, we were sitting in the room with our baby, uh, trying to keep it quiet. And... Uh, that was it. The thing is that um, straight away, once we realized that we actually hear the Arabic outside our window, and most of the explosions, uh, not only the rockets, also hand grenades and RPGs, uh, which was very weird in the beginning, uh, the electricity started to fill in the half of the kibbutz, which means that we were stuck there with no lights. No aircon, couldn't charge our phones, with no water, no food, no power banks, no nothing, because again, it's our baby's room. Uh, we started to get it. And uh, what's a group in the kibbutz? Like all kinds of messages from people, friends, family, um, people like kibbutz, it's a funny place, everyone knows it. Uh, those messages, you know, have been shot, um, leading. I'm under this, uh, this building or under this tree hiding, and they're burning us alive. Please, someone uh, come and rescue us. Um, I, one message was uh, they shot my, my wife in the head. She's dying in front of the kids. What should I do? And all, of, all those kinds of questions and, and messages from all over uh, the kibbutz. And it's 30 to 50, 100 meters away from us, and we just can't go out and help anyone. Um, also, uh, because of my, uh, my work, uh, I knew that we can't lock the door of the safe room from the inside, which means that I stood for 20 hours straight holding the door so no one would be able to open it from the outside. And Maya was holding Ziv, our baby, for 20 hours straight. Um, just like in the Holocaust, you know, the dummy in the mouth and a hand on, on the dummy, uh, just leaving the nose open so you can breathe, but it won't make any noise. Basically, our mission was door closed and baby quiet. That's about it. And we didn't even talk to each other, like we barely talked to each other during all of this time. We knew exactly what we need to do. Uh, we even kind of sacrificed our dog. Uh, we put it in between the safe room and the entrance door because we knew that they are afraid of dogs. And if they'll come in, they'll shoot her first, and then we'll hear that they are inside. Um, Sapir, could you expand a little bit in terms of who else the the bar out here with you guys and your life from a family perspective? So everyone understands the magnitude of the family that you had there and sort of how you guys were communicating with each other during this time. So um, we're a big clan. Um, my mother had uh, one brother, and both of them came to the kibbutz when they were very young. Uh, fell in love, got married, not, in, not with each other. Uh, my, we have, uh, I, used, I had. Uh, four sisters and one brother. Um, four of us, we 
which she's me and a few of her sisters that have married. Uh, we all agreed that my parents live in the kibbutz, and from my uncle's side, it was him and his wife and four kids, but three of them lived in the kibbutz. Uh, very early, we just started to contact each other on the family WhatsApp group, and everyone answered. But uh, very early, we realized that one of my sisters is not responding. Uh, her, her husband, and her twins, that month old. The last message she sent was uh, at 5 minutes to 7. Uh, she wrote how delighted they have to be stuck in the safe room with two full diapers from the night. Uh, and we started to be, started to be very worried. Um, she started to send the patients, um, also from our house, and our friends, and the sisters, and the parents, and my uncle, like ev everyone we knew from the army, from the police, the Shabbat, the Secret Service, everyone we knew. And, uh, there was no answer for a long time. And when we did the answers, um, it was very, very complicated uh, to get into the kibbutz and to get to people because of the amount of the terrorists that was there. We didn't know, of course, because we were stuck in the safe room. Uh, later on, we learned that uh, the Zaka collected more than 250 bodies of the terrorists only in, in, only in our kibbutz. And many of them either kidnapped people and went back to Gaza or came to steal things or just to put things on fire and went back. Or I can see videos from that day, or the watches, the videos, you can see videos. And then practically standing in line, walking like it's a, it's a boardwalk. A boardwalk, just going into our kibbutz, civilians, children, old people. I actually saw a video of this old guy walking with the branches. Yeah, they just came into our kibbutz to kidnap people. Hamas has promised them uh, ten thousand shekels and apartment for. Uh, they kidnapped, uh, and also they stole a lot of things, whatever they couldn't steal, they burnt. So our kibbutz was filled with a hundred terrorists, civilians, I don't know if I can put civilians with what they've done, but uh, just plain people from Gaza who just came in and did whatever they want in our kibbutz. So it was a lot. And like we said, we were only, we were 900 people in the kibbutz at that day, there were much less. Because, there were, because it was the holidays, so you can understand the amount. Um, somewhere around noon, uh, my sister's neighbor uh, texted us that uh, it was one of first. It was uh, one of the two people from the first response team that were still underneath their feet. Two out of the twelve. Uh, it's like a group of civilians, people from the kibbutz that. Basically, volunteered to jump out and protect the kibbutz if something happens. Uh, seven of them died, murdered, got shot in the first half an hour. Uh, three of them got seriously injured, and only two left on their feet. Uh, those people left their families, their wives, and their kids in the safe room and went out to protect the kibbutz. If one of them, even while he was lying, bleeding outside, the, the kid and his wife and three kids. And so my sister neighbor texted us that he saw uh, my sister's door open, front door open, uh, an empty AK-47 magazine, Kalashnikov, uh, on the stairs. And he knew that the, the twins are crying. But he couldn't get inside the apartment because everyone he tried to, they, they shot at him. So again, we sent the location of my sister's house to everyone we just knew. And uh, we actually begged uh, so someone would go rescue them. And for many hours, no one could, we didn't get answers. 
think I think until that moment we were your brain has a very strong uh, uh, denial mechanism which you don't really believe you tell stories to yourself so we thought well maybe they we are we were built and maybe they fell asleep maybe they're like something that's why they're not answering we also thought about all the messages that we're getting why are people exaggerating like why would they write that they just killed their parents help is on the way you don't need to exaggerate everything is okay don't worry so i think when we got the messages the message that the twins are crying and the door is open was the first time we realized that like the excuses were running out for ourselves so that was when we really like started even before that we texted everyone but at that point we said listen there's two babies there they're alive we know they're alive somebody needs to go there and save the baby because they're alone you know we we heard we heard that for them at seven in the morning these babies are nine months old ten months old I'm sorry we had 11 months old so we know such a small baby can't be left by itself for such a long time so we just kept on telling whoever we could you need to go save the babies you need to go save the babies but nobody the answer we got is things are very complicated all the forces are at your kibbutz all the forces are coming but things are very complicated everyone is trying we just we even got this message uh, the term of hours we were in the uh, in the safe room from wise friends from the shabak he told us uh, guys i'm sorry it's way too complicated to get to you as a kibbutz not as us uh, prepare to spend the night in the safe room and remind you it's a place that we will with no electricity no water no food uh, the, the safe room designs for rockets bombs not when someone wants to get into your house and murder you and so there was no air also and at, at that point i told my uh, um, of course i didn't think there are 400 terrorists outside so i told my that i'm going to bring the twins because uh, i started to get messages from people in the other side of the kibbutz and i knew the route like how i'm going to get to the sister's house in less than three minutes grab the twins and come back but she told me um, <laughs> uh, it's a suicide mission and uh, our son will grow up with no father and they'll grow up with, with no uncle so you're not going anywhere um, when i look back it's um, miracle number two so like again we it's very hard to explain the situation but you need to understand like dan said at the beginning it's a very small place we've been getting these messages from this what this childhood friend wife that she's worried about her husband and he's wounded the one in the first response unit and from a woman that her kid is in the same daycare with our kid and that she says her husband is wounded and he needs someone to go and do an artery thing for him and everything that we're saying is like it's 50 meters from our house it's like going out i think this high school is bigger and and you can't you just can't do anything you can't go out you can't yeah could you i want to make sure everyone really understands the values of the twins are alive today uh Tabir, could you please share why we think the twins are alive today um so we're on 8 8 30. we got a phone call from the same guy that told us that the help is on the way and that we will spend the night here that the twins are rescued we asked about the guard and guy and how cancer was, they're not on the abducted list. And again, like the, the nine's mechanism, we didn't even think what he's not telling us. We didn't ask any questions. We we're just happy that they are not on the abducted list. And 20 minutes later, uh, my brother and me uh, told me that it's confirmed and Adam and are dead. Uh, later on, we, we learned that uh, uh, they saw my sister just like I went out to call the dog because who thought something like this can happen? And Adam left the safe room with the diapers to get rid of the diapers and fix bottles for the twins. And 
uh, her kitchen window facing the street. And uh, we've been there a few weeks after that Saturday. And the uh, bullet holes tells the whole story. So they saw her through the window and shot her. All of the wall behind her was full of bullet holes. And uh, they found her in her pajamas, lying on the kitchen floor with two bottles of in her hand. And uh, we saw a bullet hole in the ceramic on the floor. So we understand what happened there. Um, her husband closed the door behind him and the twins. And I don't even want to think what went through his mind while he was doing it, after he saw and heard what happened to his wife. Um, they had two cribs for the twins, one in the front door and one on the side. Luckily, he was smart enough to put both of them in the side one because uh, on their safe room door, you see three bullet holes. Two of them hit the eye in the body, and the third one was um, just where the crib uh, stood. The door isn't bulletproof. A lot of people thought it's bulletproof, but it's not bulletproof, and a lot of people got uh, injured or got killed through the safe room door. It was also the same hole we saw in the ceramic in the kitchen we saw in the safe room, which means that they shoot him in the head as well, just next to the twins. And you, need, you need to understand it's not that just, just shoot them uh, next to the twins. It, I, we saw the blood stains on the floor, so you can see he dragged himself all the way to the other side of the room, and they must have gone into the room and walked to the other side of the room, like across the room, saw the two babies lying there, and just shot his their dad. The safe room is less than nine square meters. Um, anyway, um, what happened is that they left the twins in the crib with on diapers, with no food, no water, no nothing, and used them as bait, let them cry for 14 hours, almost 14 hours, so people would hear them and would come to rescue them. And every time that someone did, he got shot. So basically, they stayed in my sister's um, apartment with two bodies and two crying babies, 10 months old, for 14 hours till the army succeeded to get control of the house. You know, we don't want anyone to confuse and think uh, they left the babies out of the uh, humane causes or anything like that, uh, because that would have been. First, you won't leave them in, a, in the same room with their dead father for 14 hours. And second, you would do something to help them. Like, I can't even imagine hearing a baby cry for so many hours and not giving him assistance. Uh, but we know about horrible things they did to babies. There's a baby at the same age who's been held right now in Gaza. There's babies that were murdered that day in the most horrible ways you can imagine. So these babies were left al alive just because they used whatever uh, wicked purpose these animals have. So don't, don't, don't be confused about the reason that, they're, that they left them. Um, while we were in the safe room, we got a few messages from people in the kibbutz. The first one was, uh, they're going to burn your houses probably in order to push you out. Uh, stay in, stay food. Uh, it's better to get some parents than to be caught by the Hamas. And then, like less than half an hour later, uh, don't leave your safe room. Uh, the Air Force is going to bomb the kibbutz. Exactly. Yeah, that so was that, that was our response. So. I remember looking at them. I told him. What are they going to do? But we're here. Like, what? How are we supposed to defend ourselves from an air force bombing? What are What are you supposed to do when you receive a message like this? And also, when they tell you they're going to burn your house, like you're you're stuck in this situation and you have no idea what to do. All this, you need to make all these choices, and no one has ever prepared you to anything like this. 
you have no one you can uh, uh, ask for or get advice from, everyone we're talking to or I think even more blind than we were. I remember, I remember that even when, when in Bar, my brother rang us to tell us that the guy died there. And um, at that point, we lost contact with uh, Adar, obviously, in the morning. Then with Vital, uh, my other sister, with his three kids. Uh, we had five babies in less than 10 months in our family, which means that in each house, we had a baby younger than one year old. Uh, and two of my sisters had two elder boys, of, uh, each, of, each, of, each one of them. So we lost contact with Adar at that point in the morning, then with Vital, and we knew that terrorists were in her house. And we threw a grenade in the safe room and, and shot all over. And we lost contact with Ophir, my third sister, uh, also with three boys. And we knew that they were twice in her house. And we we left with maybe 10 or 15% battery. So we knew that in matter an hour or two, they're going to lose contact with us also. So we actually told them, don't say anything to our parents. Because they were also in the safe room. And we want them to keep fighting, not to give up. And uh, all during all these 30 hours we, we were there, it was like such uh, hard decisions we had to get to make without even knowing at, at that point if it's if we choose the right decision or not. So, Tavir, you and I have spoken a lot about difficult decisions that people have to make on October 7th. Do you want to also get into some other difficult decisions some other family members on the other side of the Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, which is uh, the cousin. Um, at a certain point, you realize that you didn't lock properly the safe room window. And uh, he was in his uh, safe in his safe room with his wife Shaili and uh, Shaya, his daughter, a few weeks old. And uh, a few terrorists tried to open his window, and we realized that it's either all of them are gone, or he's going to fight on the window and save his wife and his child, and he basically sacrificed himself. He fought with them on the window and gave uh, Shaili and Shaya the time they didn't, they needed to run away. And he got shot also uh, in his back. And while his father is fighting on the handle, not just like I did, uh, in his house. Um, in, in our case, it took them almost 24 hours to get to rescue us. By that time, we passed out, three of us, and we opened our, on, on the floor of our safe room, and we opened our eyes at 5.30 in the morning with guns in our, face, in our faces, and we heard Hebrew, so we were so happy because we realized those are soldiers. But they took us to a different department because we didn't have enough armed vehicles to take us out of the kibbutz. And we were there. They gave us, they gave us, they, they woke us up and they told us, okay, you have two minutes to pack. So just think what, what you pack in two minutes. Uh, we took basically stuff and we tried to take some stuff that we had, like some clothes, but they kept on telling us, no, don't go, get anywhere near the windows. The terrorists are still out there. It's by foot to the building behind us, which was maybe 30, 40 meters, 50 meters behind us. Something that would usually take us like a minute or two to walk. It took us almost 20 minutes because this under fire, they were still shooting at us. Vir was holding Ziv, our baby. I was holding a small dog that Vir hates so much, but he actually saved our lives. And the soldier, one of the soldiers was holding our big dog. Uh, and we just kept on getting down. They kept on telling us, get down, get down. There's shooting. There's... So we took a step. Not get down. So they just pushed us to the ground with every few steps. Because of the grenades, the shooting. 
So then they took us to another apartment behind us where they collected 19 people from our neighborhood. Uh, it was all, it was, like you said, a neighborhood of young adults. So we were the only ones there with the baby. We were the last one that they rescued. Everyone were just shocked to see us with the baby. They just asked us, how did you survive? How did you manage to hide with the baby? It was a neighborhood that it was uh, hit badly. And, and then we stayed there for almost five more hours, four more hours. In that apartment, the terrorists, I guess, noticed that the soldiers were there and they brought uh, the civilians there, so they started to shoot at the apartment while we're there. Now, I'm talking about it's a kibbutz apartment, okay? The kibbutz student apartment, it's a two-bedroom apartment where they put 19 civilians and I don't know how many soldiers. So they started shooting at the apartment. At one point, the soldiers went out to fight them, and by that point, we already saw their wounded soldiers, soldiers who were bleeding, soldiers. And so they went out to fight the terrorists. Luckily they won and they came back. And at some point, I think around 10 in the morning, the next day, October 8th, uh, they brought armed vehicles and they took us out of the kibbutz finally. Uh, that was, the, that was the, the time, the first time actually that we, that we saw what's, what's going on. Yeah. Uh, all the the houses, the bodies, uh, the cars, the pickup trucks that the, right ter the, the terrorists came in into the kibbutz with, uh, and also it was it was still it was it was, it was still going. You know, the, the, it all started Saturday six thirty in the morning. They took us out of the kibbutz Sunday ten thirty in the morning. And the combat in the kibbutz finished only Tuesday afternoon, around 5.30 in the afternoon. Yeah. And Will said we were blind, just one more thing. We, like, when they, when they told us, we were so blind, we had no idea what's going outside. We could just hear and smell. So when they told us they're burning the houses down to get people out, we didn't know if our house was burning or not, because we kept, we kept on smelling this burnt smell. But we didn't know if it's our house or not. So we just, the whole time, we kept on touching the walls and the floor just to make sure if it's my house that's burning, because it, this is burning. I at least want to know, maybe I'll jump. I, like, you don't know what you're going to do, but at least you want to know. And also, Bill said we lost contact with the two more sisters of him. I'm going to say the most horrible thing. But I think once we got out, after a few hours, we insist, insisted when we got out, we realized that they rescued one of the sisters with her kids, but another sister was still in the kibbutz with her three kids. And by that time, we didn't hear anything from them. We were sure we were not going to see them again. Uh, so Dvir insisted that they, miss it, that they will go in and find her. They went in, they brought her out. And it's very, it's, I can't believe I'm even saying it, but I think we were relieved to know that we just lost one. Like, uh, we thought it's going to be much, much worse. And there is family, families that, that hit so worse. We have a family that the whole family has gone. Five people, good family. We have a family, uh, Kutstein, uh, Lipstein, the grandma, the grandkids, two grandkids, the yeah. father, like the whole three generation in few families, two families that both husbands were like, it hit every house so many. Not, not, I don't think there's a single house in the kibbutz that wasn't hit, and you can demonstrate it the most. With I always like to give the example of our son's um, daycare class. There are 14 kids there. One, two of them are the twins. Adar and Itai got murdered. Two kids lost their fathers. Uh, one kid lost two grandparents together. And the uh, kindergarten teacher, the, the daycare teacher, lost her husband. One of the caregivers was murdered. Her father was murdered. And they kidnapped her mother, her sister, which was also one of the caregivers in the kindergarten. She was actually our nanny or something like this. She was kidnapped to Gaza, 17 year old uh, girl. Another one lost both of her grandparents. Yeah. Uh, another girl was buried, burnt alive. With her parents, the baby, the baby. There were three houses from us. Luckily, they survived, but they were very uh, severely injured. Uh, 
The mom is a doctor, she's still in hospital, she's still recovering uh, and in rehabilitation. So I think you can pretty much understand, like we had 60, 63 people. We lost them uh, Friday, uh, Saturday, sorry. We lost 63 members, uh, 18 were kidnapped. Uh, luckily, we got back 11 of them. Uh, another two, uh, th if you heard that three hostages were, were released into a crossfire with, between the Israelis and the Hamas, the IDF and Hamas, and all three of them died. Two of them were from our kibbutz, which means that now we have 65 dead. And uh, five of the kidnap people, out of the 136 that are still in Gaza, five of them are still are from our kibbutz. And uh, this is the main reason that we came to the States in the first place. We came on a delegation to Washington uh, to meet with the Congress and the Senate. And uh, this isn't a uh, shirt, I bring the home shirt of our kibbutz, Baraza Abai Chedi. Baraza, it's my home. Um, I think this is the main reason we're here because these people, we would like to think that most of them are still alive, and we believe that everyone needs to do everything to get them back. The people from our kibbutz are still there, are kids eagle. The 60, 66. 66. He's a father, he's a grandfather, he's a United States citizen. And we have two young women, Doron Steinbrecher and Emily Damari. Doron is uh, 30 years old, and uh, Emily is 27 years old. Two beautiful women that were actually supposed to be in the last deal uh, of the exchange. And in the last minute, Hamas broke the deal. And we've heard stories from people that came back from the, the captivity. We know what's going on there, especially to young women. This was a group of young women that was supposed to come out at the, the last deal. So we can only be very worried about why didn't must go through that deal. What are they hiding? Why don't they want the world to know? Uh, unfortunately, we have a very good idea of what's going on there. And uh, we also have two twin brothers. We're 26 years old, Gali and Zivi, who their mom is going crazy from worrying to them. Uh, so we just want to say they have no more time and anybody needs to do whatever they can to just bring them back now. Everyone, every voice counts, you need to keep it on the top priority, on the main agenda. Uh, we went to Congress, but I'm sure everyone here knows people or has just do whatever you can to make people think about them and talk about them so that they will come back because they really have no more time uh, to stay there. They need to come back now. And these are just civilians. The, these are not hostages. These are not soldiers who are taken in battle. These are people who were taken from their homes with their pajamas. It was uh, summer that time. Now it's winter in Israel. They're cold, they're hungry. Some of them are sick. Some of them are wounded, we know people have, they just need to come back now. So yeah, I want to go back to one thing you were talking about grandparents. Uh, you were talking about grandparents, and the family link between your sister Hadar and your cousin Yahab is your grandfather goes to jail. How did you guys handle their deaths with him? Um, so, um, it took us more than a month to tell him what happened. Um, we just didn't know how to do it. Uh, we knew we can do uh, one Holocaust. And uh, we, were, we weren't sure if, if we'll survive the, the second Holocaust. And I remember uh, we buried my sister, uh, her husband, and yeah, my cousin together in the same cemetery, one next to each other, one day apart. And then the second day when we buried Yav, my cousin, uh, I have, still have this picture in my head that I see my mother and my uncle sits together 
between two graves. And the same day we decided that uh, we'd find a way um, with the, the crew that in the nursing house that were staying with my parents uh, to tell him. It took us another two weeks or so, but we did it. It was horrible. And he said something that I don't think it, if, if we could leave me in, in the next few years, he told us uh, that he's sorry that he survived. He, he feels sorry that he survived the first Holocaust. Um, because he buried all of his family in there, and now he's burying two of his grandkids. And if he wouldn't survive the Holocaust, um, we were here. So we didn't need to uh, go through this Holocaust. So I pushed to bear on that a little bit. I know it's hard to hear it, but I think it represents the trauma and pain that everybody in Israel is feeling today. Um, to have someone survive through the worst atrocities of the 20th century. And produced an amazing family with so much hope and, and progress for his life and his world. He just still had eight grandchildren to survive October 7th. You feel like he wishes he never would have survived because he lost two grandchildren and 10 great grandchildren. Um, that hits me harder than any other part of the story. Um, and I think it's important for everybody who's here tonight to recognize that. Amidst all of this pain and trauma and misery that so many Israelis are experiencing, there's still a tremendous amount of denial around the world around what took place. I was in Israel four weeks ago, and unfortunately, unfortunately, um, uh, they screened a 47 minute film the group that I was with. I saw things that I can't unsee um, situations where one or two bullets would have done the job. People shooting seven, eight, nine times to flee. I saw beheadings. I saw burned bodies. And celebrations taking place as this was going on throughout the video. Many times filmed with GoPros from Hamas, celebrating like Pep Capilla High School kids would after scoring a goal in the soccer field or a basketball basketball field. And so I think it's important that we all act as advocates and recognize the voice of the people who survived these atrocities. And we all do our part to continue to uh, spread the word about what took place that day and on behalf of the hostages that are being unhelped. Um, I know it's sort of an awkward time to pivot to a QA. and a um, uh, We found that some of the most valuable parts of these discussions are ones to give people in the audience the opportunity to ask questions and to learn and to hear about things that maybe haven't been shared already. Um, ask for maybe just two ground rules for any of those questions. Veer and Maya are just your average Israeli citizens who have tremendous strength by being here and surviving October 7th. They're not politicians, they're not diplomats. So please, no political questions. And also, no questions you know, about what they want to see happen in the last minutes. So that's a good discussion. Um, and so, with that, I, I encourage anyone who wants to ask any questions, either put their microphone in the audience or if anyone wants to raise their hand, I'm happy to, to call you. Yes. Yeah, so the, the question was, were there Palestinians, um, Gazans really, where they were, that lived and worked in the U.S.? And I'd say to Beer, beyond that, I would also maybe use this as an opportunity to talk about the history of the relationships that your family and your kibbutz had with Gazans. So, uh, first, just briefly, is uh, Neta. She's from our kibbutz. She can say it because she's even older than me. Um, I won't say how old, I won't say the age, don't worry. Um, anyway, when we were young, um, we used to go fix our cars in Gaza, we used to go to Gaza and get our furniture. Um, do you remember Anwar? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, he was the gardener, he was from Gaza, basically he raised us all, he was all over here. Jan were taking us on, on the tractor, and, and in the roads of the kibbutz. Uh, so we are in a very good relationship. Uh, holidays, they are on special occasions, weddings, and he used to come to, with us to the kibbutz, most of the holidays and stuff like that, he used to go do it there. Um, so, 30 years plus back, we were in a very good relationship. And uh, because of my occupation, I'm a civil engineer and I work uh, in construction. Uh, so, I worked a lot with, with Palestinians in general. And with Gazan in particular, uh, not long ago, less than, less than a year ago, we just finished uh, a project. The group only from Gaza. Uh, so we worked in our kibbutz and all around. And uh, unfortunately, actually, if I say it much better, well, you know, okay, we go in the past year or two, I think. It was the year that uh, the people in Gaza got the most work permits to come to Israel. Uh, because we had this belief that uh, if they will come and work and if they will have money, they can provide their families, they will have no reason to go to terror, to crime, things like this. So they uh, wanted to come to the Hamas. Yeah, they wanted work. to work for Hamas. Uh, we also had a lot of trucks going in with aid, uh, building materials. We lived there, so you could see the trucks every morning. There was just a traffic jam of trucks, hundreds of trucks every morning going into Gaza. A lot of money went into Gaza. Unfortunately, on a lot of the terrorists, and I'm not even talking about the civilians, I'm talking about the terrorists uh, who committed the crimes on October 7th, they found work permits on their bodies. Uh, they found work permits on them. And also, we do know that a lot of them uh, had, they had these specific maps with names of houses and people. They knew exactly where the armory is. Like, Things that you can only know if you have someone from inside. So we're pretty sure that they got information from the people who came in to work. And also, there is a very good uh, story that can tell you the whole thing. We had a woman in our kibbutz that she was a photographer. A lot of people in our area they are very peace activists, uh, like Shalom Achshar, uh, who are. Uh, they were driving Palestinians who came from Gaza to get medical treatments. They were going to demonstrations. They were very activists in these things. And we actually had the kite festival every year that was being held by the Kutz family. And that the whole, uh, uh, the whole, uh, the whole idea, idea was, festival. yeah, they will, they will uh, shoot rockets at us. We will fly kites because you can see the kites from Gaza. So we had the kites with all the peace symbols, uh, which was supposed to take place on October 7th. Uh, and it was being held by the Kutz family. Unfortunately, we all know what happened on October 7th, and the Kutz family was all murdered on that day together in their room. They hugged on their bed. Um, five people, two parents and three kids. We have a woman in our kibbutz, uh, that she was a photographer, she was also a peace activist, and she used to do a shared uh, exhibition with a photographer from Gaza, but everything was supposed to be like a piece to show how it looks like here, how it looks like there, the wall, whatever. And on October 7, he called her and he started to ask her these weird questions. Like, do you know what the army is? What's going on here? What's going on? She immediately understood that he's not, he's asking questions for a very specific reason and he's collaborating with Hamas. And again, this is supposed to be a guy that was a peace activist. So I think it sums it up. <laughs> not political at all. In the, in the bottom line, we are not going anywhere and they are not going anywhere. So the only reason is to find the way to live together. That's, that's the problem. I just hope that out of this horrible war, and this is a horrible war, 
that there will come a situation that everyone will understand that maybe there's enough evil and now let's do something good. Let's, let's move to the next level. Well, uh, this morning we were in talk and there was a question was about trust and it was so uh, sort of direction towards all. It's hard to process that. And in terms of the level of trauma that people in Israel are experiencing, I'm going to use one of Kabir's lines here, but you know, uh, people sent counters to the family after October 7th to, you know, to, to try and provide help. And for the first 20 minutes, the, the counselors uh, would be speaking to Kabir and Maya. In the last 40, which is everyone, the last 40, the people, the victims of who are experiencing the trauma are counseling the counselors because they can't even handle it. Right? Yeah, they're just crying for 40 minutes and we can consult them. <laughs> it's hard for you, right? It's hard for you. It's not easy. <laughs> and also, like, they, a lot of them are quitting after yeah. one or two appointments with us. Uh, we probably have time for one or two more questions before we wrap up. Anybody else? Yes. I imagine you both served in the IDF. Um, as an American, can you explain the policy about self defense and weapons, perhaps in Israel or in the support? Um, so, so for people who didn't hear, um, he was asking questions about, about them serving the IDF and what the sort of gun policy is in Israel and on the people of Israel also understand it too. So in Israel, when no, no one basically accepted to have a gun license, so you can have a gun. Most of us don't have. Uh, lately, because of uh, a lot of uh, weapons, uh, been stolen. So even the, uh, the, uh, the soldiers are not allowed to go out from the bases with the gun. And most of us doesn't have guns in our house. Um, I also think a lot of people don't want guns. We don't want them. Like it's not that somebody wanted a gun and he didn't get a license. There's not, there wasn't such a big demand for guns. A lot, a lot of people said that there is no, um, there is no logic in Israel, you need to lock the magazine and the gun itself in two different places. And a lot of people are saying, first, we don't know, the, we don't, I don't think I need it. Obviously, now I do. But I didn't think I need it. Second, um, a lot of people said it's, there's no logic about putting the magazine over there, the gun over there, when I need it right now. And also, it's a common belief that if you have a gun in your house, most likely it will be used against you. Like, I think people are worried to, to <coughs> carry a gun in their homes, to hold a gun in their homes, especially if you have kids. And, and the most ridiculous thing is that, um, unfortunately, the seven people from our first response team died. So a lot of them died on the way to the armory because the weapons weren't with them in the houses, they were in the armory. And they knew exactly where the armor is and where they care. So I'm going to end on somewhat of a lighthearted note. Because uh, we've had a few of, uh, we've had, had Kabir and Maya come stay with us for a few years, had uh, Lowe stay with us a few months ago. So given that we're in Baltimore, they don't really understand the term small to more. They don't understand where it comes from. But we found out when we got to our house that Maya's mother was actually born in Baltimore. <laughs> and she, uh, she was born, uh, she lived in Ashford, and she lived on Dorchester Street, Dorchester Road. And I found out that's also where my father lived at the same time. Right? So what's more small for than that? And we have, and we have um, uh, Maya's mother's first cousin, John Rogers, here tonight. Some people in Baltimore may know John Rogers. Um, so uh, John's mother, Sarah. 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 Yeah. John's mother, Sarah, who turns 100 in April, God willing, um, was sister with Maya's mother. And so, grandmother, grand, grandmother I'm sorry, it's been a long few weeks okay. for me, and that has been like for them. Um, we, met, we met first today. I saw Sarah, I think, more than 20 years ago last time, when she was going to be 100 on April 3rd, right? I remember. And I just wanted to say at the beginning, I don't know if you said it or. Somebody said that this is a room full of strangers, but I wanted to say this room is not full of strangers because we have family here. So, so amidst all this pain, there are still beautiful reconnections that are taking place.
place. I, John, I want to thank, thank you for letting me be part of, be part of that today. It was a very special experience. Um, and on behalf of everyone here, I want to thank you here and Maya for doing everything we did for you. Why she says the Chaim? Chaim, do you love me? And Chaim said, of course I love you. We're friends for years. And Why she said, but do you really love me? He said, of course I love you. You know I love you. Why she said, but do you really love me? Chaim said, well, I have something to prove it. And he says, my arm hurts. Does your arm hurt? Our arm hurts. Our hearts hurt. And we're crying. And it's astounding to me that you're able to tell the stories that you are. But I think we are absolutely obligated as much as it hurts to hear this because it's us that hurt and you that hurt. And we stand with you. That the is going to do something to show that we stand with you. Whereby Pony is going to describe how we're doing that. So we hope that, first of all, that you feel a big hug from everyone who's here and from all of Baltimore, from the whole Jewish community, and also not from the Jewish community who are joining us this evening. Um, Dr. Shore is going to present you with something in a moment uh, that shows that. Um, we also want to mention, first of all, I mentioned it's 100 days for the hostages this coming Sunday. There's a community uh, walk that's being done uh, over at Physica Moon at 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. And we also wanted to uh, let you know uh, first here that uh, we're going to be having a solidarity mission coming from Beth Tefillah going to Israel at the end of February. It's February 26th, actually. It was February 26th through March 1st, led by Rabbi Yoga. Um, for uh, four nights and five days there, visit some of the keep it seen down south and get together and volunteer. Um, so that information is out now. Um, sign up quickly so that uh, there's space and we'll be able to be there with you. And we want you to be able to take a bit of that to fill Just a little bit of that. I feel a little silly after such a deep conversation. But I'm going to present you. We have to get the conversation. Because that's what you get. What's that? <laughs> school, all of a sudden to see this wall with the pictures of the people in Gaza. I think it's so emotional at the beginning and it's hard to get me emotional these days. And I just want to thank you so much. You're doing a lot. I couldn't believe I'm seeing it on the other side of the world. So really thank you so much. Thank our teachers and thank our students because they're the ones who make it.